All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Connecting Tucson with Jamie Overturf, where we focus on connecting our community and local businesses. Today, we have two interesting guests in our Stuart Tyrell studios, and I cannot wait for you to get to know each of these gentlemen, so we are going to dive right in today. First up, we have Mark Barris. Mark is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Flying Leap and is the company's co-founder. If you don't know what Flying Leap is, you will get to learn that throughout this podcast, so please stay tuned. Uh, Mark is a native of Washington State, but we will not hold that against you. (laughs) Um, Mark is also married to his wife, Michelle, who is also a native Tucsonian and resides in Vail, Arizona. Together, they raise Siberian Huskies. Um, Their names are Comrade, Indigo, Yukon, and Balto, which is my favorite, along with a lone parrot named Sparky, I assume for ASU. Uh, no, uh, that's just a cool name. Okay, Learned okay. It, years ago, before I even knew where ASU was. <laughs> Love it. Well, you moved to Tucson in 2006, and um, you are following your retirement from the U.S. Air Force, and you've made Southern Arizona your home, and I cannot wait to share your story here. Indeed. So thank you for coming on. You're very thank- welcome. Glad to be here. And thank you for your service. Pleasure to serve. And next up, we have William Kuba. William's held many interesting careers in his lifetime, ranging from a high school teacher to a jet aircraft mechanic in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, currently, William is an independent insurance broker specializing in health care plans, ranging from Medicare and Medicare supplements to standalone plans for non-Medicare clients, such as dental, vision, and much, much more. Uh, he lives in Rancho Del Lago with his wife, Jillian, and loves to travel whenever he can. I've heard you've taken a few trips here this past year. Well, a year, yeah. Every year we do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, yeah. William, and thank you for your service. Um, may I call you Bill? You better. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Because I won't know who you're talking to. (laughs) All right. Well, I normally do call you Bill, but I just introduced you as William, so we're there. I'm going to go ahead and start with you, William, if that's okay, and uh, or Bill. Bill. I will call you Bill. (laughs) Why am I calling him William? I've known him for like three years. (laughs) This is interesting. (laughs) Wow. His business card here says Bill. All right. (laughs) I promise I've had none of the wine <laughs> as of yet. But um, okay, so Bill, thank you again. We're going to go ahead and start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you did, how you got into this business, and um, how I got into it. insurance. Insurance, because because oh, yeah. uh, I retired a couple of times and realized that I can't sit at home and do nothing. I like to be out with people and doing things and learning new things, and uh, uh, I try to. Several different things. One, uh, when we first moved here 16 years ago, I was selling um, high-end RVs with uh, one of the stores here. And uh, my wife said, why don't we do something together? Why don't we get into a business? And so we did a franchise flower uh, shop. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. But it turned out our franchisor was a crook. <laughs> oh, no. oh boy. So do we want to elaborate on that or should we just bypass the whole? Um, so flower, you've done so many different things. So why? Well, that's because I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> True. You are. You're not that old, Bill. Um, but you, you obviously are keeping going. What got you into insurance? Why, why the insurance industry versus flowers or per se um, – opening your own business or restaurant? Ooh, that, that's a... My wife had been in the restaurant business for 25 years, and we would never go into the restaurant business, especially <laughs> in, in this day and age. <laughs> but uh, um, I think somebody just suggested, why don't you talk to these people? And I did, and I ended up actually going with farmers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's how come you have my account. <laughs> <laughs> that was a slight plug there, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, uh, that just didn't work out for me. And uh, I tried a couple other things and then ended up, um, God, I, I, I met somebody and they said, hey, why don't you look at this? And I did. And uh, uh and this the being medi- Medicare. The Medicare, yeah, the Medicare this thing. This being the Medicare. Care. So obviously yeah. Medicare, it's done well for you for the past five years. You've been yeah. in it for a very long time now, yeah. and you're very successful. So 
why did you choose on the Medicare area or the health care? Uh, I don't know. Some Probably because I sort of identify with that being over 65. And uh, uh, and I, I looking at what what's available for somebody through Medicare is so complicated that it's fun to get into because most people have no idea uh, what's available to them. So and, you like to go in and investigate and try to help people out, and and that's right. basically why you got into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there's so many ramifications of of healthcare that uh, uh, and things that are available, and uh, every day it's changing, and and more things are being added, or or some things are being removed. And you just hit the nail on the head. There are so many things that are being added in healthcare and removed in healthcare to keep up with that. I mean, do you enjoy sleepless nights? Because I'm just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> No. Okay. Well, obviously Uh, that um, Medicare, you offer so many more things than Medicare. Tell us some of the products that you do offer. um, Gosh, you know, we mentioned the the dental and and vision. And And these are for non-Medicare people, correct? Non-Medicare, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've got something that I've really gotten interested in lately is because... Um, uh, uh, it's a, a hospital indemnity plan okay. where uh, we all have co-pays for different things. A lot of my Medicare clients have um, like the first six days of, of hospital care, they have a copay, and it's somewhere between, depending on the company, uh, 150 and $300 a, a month, mm-hmm. or I mean a day. For the first six days before it becomes um, a, a no copay, uh, and that's also available for anybody who has a, a health insurance program that has a copay for hospital stay, uh, and uh, and it's really inexpensive. Um, so that pays for the copay that you're there, the hospital indemnity plan. Is that what yeah, you're talking because, about? Yeah, because you could, uh, for instance, if you had six days of $300 a day, uh, you're, you know, you're looking at $3,600. Uh, and a lot of people on Medicare, that, that would be kind of a hard... Well, a lot of people in any kind of plan don't have that kind of money sitting around that uh, they can spare. Uh, so this for, for uh, you know, dollars a day... Uh, you can have that coverage. So obviously that's not something that you're just out there talking about like on your website. So how do people, how do you set yourself apart? How do you get people to come to you? What do you do? Um, basically, I just stay in touch with all my clients. So um, like I, like yesterday, I delivered a, a birthday uh, gift to a client because it was their birthday. You know. So wait, you went to their house and delivered? Oh, you bet. So you're very much a hands-on type personal oh, getting yeah. out there? Because it gives me an opportunity to see how they're doing with their health situation in relationship to the policy that they have. So that way, if you see something that might need changed, you can offer some suggestions while you're there? Uh, it, that, yeah, that, and just to let them know that that there's somebody who's concerned with their situation. I don't think I've ever had a health insurance agent do like, <laughs> that's a new one. I have to say really? that's probably got a set. Have you heard of that? It, well, he cares. It's, it's wonderful. It's, I think that's very one. I, I've never really heard of anybody. It's delivering and warm. It is. So yeah. that's, that's wonderful. So, yeah. um, I also, I also at Christmas time do all of them. So you, you go to every single one of your clients at Christmas time, and, and what do you do? Just hand them a card or no, no, just visit, I, I, talk? Um, depends on, the, on the, the person. Sometimes it's flowers. Sometimes it's candy. Uh, I have one, one client that I happen to get uh, uh, to enroll at, at her birthday, which is right uh, just before Thanksgiving. And... Um, I had a uh, pumpkin pie in in the car that I had picked up for something else, and uh, she was saying, "Well, I've got all these people coming over," and I said, 
well, guess what? Here's a pumpkin pumpkin pie for you if you like it. Because I, at the time, I was on a diet and I couldn't eat it anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now, so now every Thanksgiving, I bring her a pumpkin pie. Oh my goodness, that is that definitely <laughs> sets you apart. You should put that. Wow. Se- I, that's what I'm saying. I don't think I could remember like this person likes strawberries or this person likes pies. This one likes flowers. How do you keep all of that in track? Like, do I, you- I just take notes. Are you like paper and pen, or do you? No, I do it. It's either on my phone or on the computer. So if either of those goes down, uh, yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. <laughs> Well, you're like I, me. I, you're I do. I also do everything on paper. Okay. So I I have a file on all of my customers. So, well, uh, because if someone calls, just like you, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, gonna say he should. He does. I I don't really see him too much on social media or Facebook. But that would be something that, in my mind, you'd want to put out there saying, "This is how I treat my clients. I treat my clients like family." That's exactly what I'm thinking of hmm. right now. Is all of your clients are your family, and you're going and you're doing some checks on it. And I know I'd want my parents to have somebody that does that in case I can't be there. I'd like the pumpkin pie. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say. Oh, now what wine goes with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Nice port and pumpkin pie. A nice there port. You go. Yes. Okay. I like that. I or as James, James says, pumpkin pie. Right? Pump pie. <laughs> pumpkin pie. Yes. No. So, well, you obviously, you have a lot of options that you can offer your clients, and it's, you give them a lot of options to check up on them, too. I think that yeah. is really key in this day and age is you have to be able to diversify, set yourself apart, and offer people some options. And, um, you know, after having the endless options of searching through the different health care plans that are on the Internet, I could always use a good glass of wine. How about you? Well, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, no. that's morning and night. Hey, I have a question for you. So, Bill, the... Uh, Traditionally, I've always thought of insurance as sort of a impersonal product. I mean, it's a, it's a ubiquitous insurance. Is you know, there's vagaries and, and differences in coverages and stuff. But it sounds to me like you're actually making insurance coverage very personable. Right, right. And, I want to know what you need, what works right. for you, because there's there's uh, hundreds of carriers that have hundreds of different programs, right. and and they're all different. Yeah. And, and they all have they all have a different fee too, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know. So it depends on what your needs are. Um, I have families where they have children who have special needs and and are on social security disability or something like that. And uh, um, I have programs that will fit their situation, but you don't know unless you. Ask them and listen to what they right. have to so say. So in today's day and age, though, you drive, you know, you're, you're, you're so driven in business, all of us do better, faster, cheaper, better, faster, cheaper. Efficiencies, less and less personal, right? You order your groceries online. You don't look at the produce. You don't talk to the people that grow the produce. It's just a, it's just a, a banana or an orange. It comes from somewhere you don't know, right? And uh, it sounds to me like you're reversing that trend where you're taking a ubiquitous product like, like insurance and making it into a, a personalized experience for your customers, and that's exactly. Right? I, I just treat people like like I want to be treated, right? And I, I would argue to you that 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 in today's day and age, people yearn for that, and they're willing to pay a premium for it. I believe. Well, I have I have no I, I, have I 100% no. agree with what you just said. I find right. that 100% true in my business. People are looking for that service. So I'm glad that you're on so I can share this with all of my, my business people and all of my, my listeners to to help let them know what you do and what kind of service you offer. Um, so I'm excited to see what comes of that. And Mark, I'm going to come to you right now, if that's okay. You, oh, boy. <laughs> well, I mean, we just talked about having a nice glass of wine while Indeed. looking through the endless sea of whatever can be healthcare products, it seems, that are out there, or healthcare providers. Um, and, you know, wine does relax me. But in all seriousness, you've had some extensive experience in managing grapevines throughout their life cycles. This is not new to you. No. <laughs> so... Where did your passion for wine begin, and how did this process start for you? Um, the, uh, well, the, uh, I, I grew up with an agricultural uh, background, and so farming, I grew up in farm country. I worked in farms. My childhood was steeped in ranching, 
and uh, and, and agriculture and uh, the the so the 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 uh, the propensity for farming was always part of my life and uh, you know and then I did a career in the uh, in the Air Force and um, my time in the Air Force was always spent thinking of what I was going to do when I got out of the Air Force and uh, and y- you know I was always um, working towards um, a, a life after my military service was kind of always my focus <clears throat> and when those uh, days came to fruition I came out I came out here and um, you know it's it, it, most people have a subset of, of talents and skills and interests that stick with them for their throughout their life right and uh, agriculture was something that, that was my interest and when I ended up in Tucson I ended up in a corporate position uh, as an engineer uh, great great job with a local defense contractor here in, in uh, southern Arizona and uh, you know but I yearned to do something else and uh, it wasn't your calling it wasn't what you wanted to do no it wasn't my calling it was it was it, there was there was a it was enjoyable and uh, it was a great company but you know my passions lied in in wine and viticulture and you know there's there's uh, some challenges to getting into the viticulture business, it's difficult, it's highly competitive. And there's a lot of structural uh, things about it that make it difficult to do. So, but I had a, 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 a passion to go do it. I was drawn to go do it. And I knew that if I had some, uh, some like-minded folks with me, we could pool our capital together. We could do something extraordinary. And you're one of three co-owners for Indeed. Um, Flying Leap. Um, so how did that progress? How did you three come together and say, well, this is it? We're opening Flying Leap in Southern Arizona. The uh, the three of us were all dramatically different, one from the other. We've got different interests, passions, and all that great stuff. Um, but we're all inextricably tied together as friends. We've been friends since we were in our late teens in college. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Mark. I knew Mark Moeller when he had a full head of hair. And <laughs> he, he, he knew me when I was 150 pounds, right? And, oh, my uh, God. Yeah, and Tom Kitchens, I knew him when uh, you know his hair was blonder. So... Mark had um, hair. Yeah, he did. He did <laughs> years ago. He sure did. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but we've you know we we uh, we met when we were very young. We were freshmen in college at the Air Force Academy uh, in Colorado Springs. We went to a, a military academy and we uh, did our to- you know played to- toy soldier for four years and uh, got engineering degrees, great educations uh, at that school. And uh, we left after being commissioned and we traveled the world in multiple roles many different aircraft. Um, we we're all pilots. We did different things. and uh, But we were always connected. Even during our military service, we always kept in touch and visited one another and hung out together, uh, just like friends do, you know. And then Mark and I, in particular, um, had a great interest in going into business together. And I had looked at many different things after the military. I had looked at doing... Uh, some jet, you know, I'm a, I'm a jet engine guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's my other life is turbine engines and uh, rocket motors and these kinds of things. Bill's seen his share around some engines. I was motors. at Edwards. Oh, <laughs> Edwards. Ah, yes. Yeah, interesting. I've been there a day or two. Just a and, couple of days. Yeah, and, and so we had a, uh, you know, we had a great interest in this. Mark and I, in particular, though, had an interest in be- going into business together. Because we worked so well together, we were uh, dramatically different people in many different ways. I am the uh, sort of a scatterbrained idea machine. My my mind moves really, really fast, very creative, very nonlinear thinker. Mark is uh, a much more methodical. Yes, he's very methodical. Um, he's a much slower thinker, but he thinks uh, he's a lot more detail-oriented than I am. He's much more organized than I am. But so, uh, you know, so the two of us together were... Uh, you make were, a great team. We really did because our, our, our strengths were offsetting and our weaknesses were complementary. And And so, you know, where, where I was strong, he was weak. Where, where he was strong, I was weak. So you put us together in business and we were a formidable duo. And we are to this day. You know, a lot of our success at Flying Leap really derives from Mark and I's relationship together, business relationship together, and how we work together and complement one another. So tell us about Flying Leap. What makes so, that, that business so unique and how are you guys so yeah, successful? Flying Leap is a really unique wine and spirits company. And, um, you know, you can, uh, first of all, you got to understand Arizona's wine industry is very, very small. And, 
it, it's tiny. It's in in terms of wine production and uh, volume, I think it ranks uh, around the you know thirtieth, twenty eighth, twenty ninth, thirtieth, depending on what year you're talking about. In terms of volume production in the United States, so it's very very low. Uh, you know, Idaho has a bigger wine industry than Arizona. Um, Illinois' wine industry is bigger than Arizona's. I think Arkansas's wine industry is bigger. So Arizona's wine industry is very, very small. And um, the, the, the small size of the industry presents a number of great opportunities for our company and other companies like us. But you asked what makes us unique, yes. right? Okay. And uh, Flying Leaf is a very, very unique uh, operator because it's a farm winery and a farm winery. And you're probably going, well, what does that mean? That means we're vertically organized. Vertically oriented, vertically organized wine company. And that means that we grow our fruit at our own farms. We have a very large widespread agricultural business Mm. of farming and growing, harvesting our crop. Uh, We then under one roof, one company roof that is, take that crop and we produce products from it. We vinify it into wine or we distill it into brandies, whiskeys, and liqueurs. Okay. Uh, so we, we, we have our own cellaring operations. We don't outsource our cellaring. We do it ourselves in-house. Once our cellaring is complete, then we're very, very unique in that we have our own retail operation. And our retail operation is quite widespread um, on account of our licensing arrangement here in Arizona. We've got a very widespread retail footprint. So we also have our own distribution company. So we we just we actually own our own distribution company. That's big. Yeah. So we 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 don't just you know we don't uh, outsource our distribution to a major distributor as many in fact most do. We actually have our own distribution company uh, under Flying Leap, and then uh, we're diversified. So we uh, not only have our own retail operation, we have our own wholesale operation. And we also have a barbecue company called Arizona Rub. So we've got additional products other than just wine and spirits uh, for our customers. Wow. So you offer lots of options. That's right. The healthcare industry offers lots of (laughs) options. I see how I'm tying that together there. But I want to say, um, I know I've met you a couple of times over here. You have a tasting room here in Tucson, which, by the way, if nobody knows where that is, we're going to get that here at the end of the show. But you do need to to head out there. Um, I've seen you there a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Every time I go there, your staff is just so – Janie. Janie is wonderful, and she's so knowledgeable. And I see her interact with the client. She doesn't really need to go through the whole spiel on what the wines are with me anymore because I've I've seen them. Mm -hmm. How do you hire and attract staff that – promote your wines the way you do it's difficult and it takes a lot of training and it's kind of what i was talking to bill about why i was so fascinated with this pumpkin pie story see how i did that oh i okay i did let's 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 don't don't try this at home like i'm a professional (laughs) but he's a professional yeah no it's uh and and uh you know that's one of the, the the key pieces to the success of our company which is identical to what bill was saying is a success for his his business is that with our goal, hands down, is to make a personal connection with each and every guest. And, um, you know, if it, we have spent, my wife and I have gone around the country and around the world doing wine tasting. And in, invariably, it, it becomes a very impersonal experience. I've been to several where they are extremely impersonal. Yeah. They're trying to handle 20 or so people with one person and you don't get the interaction and get to know None. about the wine and, you know and every single one of yours they do. I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it didn't used to be that way in California. Mm-hmm. It used to be really personal. And then all of a sudden it got crazy and they were charging you for everything. And well, uh, Australia is personal. Uh, and the... <laughs> He brought up Australia to talk to the other Mark in the room. See that? <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is marvelous. Um, yeah, but it's it, it, you're right. It's it's a very good point. It, no. it is it is an intently personal thing. And people, we we studied customer behavior and watched what they liked, what they didn't like, the things that set them off, the things that attracted them, and and and, and invariably. Customers, when they come to a wine tasting experience, their expectation is that it's a personal kind of thing. They're, they expect that the sommelier knows what they're talking about. They expect that that the sommelier is going to bring those wines to life for that guest, right? And um, that there's going to be some kind of some kind of uh, richness to the to the tasting experience. 
you know, my, my wife and I went out to New York years ago, and I was just appalled by by some of the wine tasting. It was unbelievable. And it, it, you would walk in, there would be probably 100 people in line waiting to go taste wine. You would walk in, you would they'd grab your money up front, you'd walk in, you'd, there'd be a table, a room full of tables. You'd go to table number 39, you'd go up there, the guy <laughs> would put a sheet in front of you, and he'd say, pick three reds and three whites, and he'd walk off. And you, you, you just, you had no idea what you were tasting. You had no clue where these grapes were grown. You had no idea who made the wines, how they made the wines, what their, what their strategy with the wines was. You, you, you had no clue. You would, you would ask the sommelier about the wines when you could get his attention for more than five seconds and absolutely clueless about them. Um, you know, and it, it, to me, that was just, it was, it was awful. And, and I think that's one of the big things that I keep coming back to your your tasting room. Mm-hmm. And I've made a connection not only with Janie, but I think with your wine. And I think that's why whenever right. I do things, I, I bring your wines. Mm-hmm. So that, and I'm a wine club member. so And we're grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do. I love your products and I love what you're representing here in Arizona. And I know that you take the time to teach your sommeliers all about the wines and before they're even put in front of a customer they can we do and uh it's challenging and um you know you don't always hit the hit the target on it but you you know we look for quality people and uh we bring them in we try them out at our winery estate usually we let them try their hand at at pouring wine we look at how they interact with customers we try and coach them uh then we have our own training program that we've put together Right. Uh, that we, we hand to them. We've got a series of lectures and narratives that we've got put together, things that we've written to help them, you know, and then we quiz them and we sit down and we do one-on-one training with them. And, um, you know, and then when we feel they're ready, we let them, we let them go fly. solo. Yeah. And I mean, normally, <laughs> fly you know, fly yeah, <laughs> we, we normally send someone from our staff with them to, to, to sort of, uh, kind of, uh, do their training wheels, uh, out there in the, with customers and then, you know, we try and hit them with all kinds of different scenarios. And then when we feel they're ready to go, we let them go. And then then at that point, you know, we try to be good managers. And basically, we organize, train, and equip our company. And then we allow, we empower our sommeliers to go do great things. And they come up with their own strategies. They, we allow them to build their own relationships, like you were mentioning with Janie at our Tucson property. And uh, we let them reach out, develop their own clientele, and um we try and make sure they have the resources and the training to do that effectively, and we, then we let them just go do great things. Amazing. And I'm, I'm actually going to bring it back to Bill because this kind of puts me on something. You you do a lot of training in your own industry knowing that you've got to do continued education and you've got to not only train yourself, but you have to train your clients on what's appropriate for them. And you're doing this all by yourself in an industry that's constantly changing their their mind on what they want to do. Right. How do you keep it? All, I just got to look from my producer. <laughs> how do you keep it straight? And how do you help your client? Like if something changes on one of their policies, how do you help them understand that change and how it affects them? Uh, usually I send them a note on, okay. a, on a note card about, you know, what it, what's affecting them. Cause I, I know mostly what their needs are. And um, it's just amazing that you have all of your clients and you know exactly what they do. Well, but, I don't so, have that many clients. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, tell, <laughs> no, but how, how do you keep how do you keep apprised of all of the new, the new well, changes? Well, every what year, do do? every year you have you have to uh, uh, pass tests with each carrier to, to, yeah, to represent them. So, so if you're representing eight different carriers, you have to pass eight different tests every single year. Right. Plus, you have to do some things for the government. Everybody loves the government here, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and every year. And and every it's year, it's yeah. not like, because uh, I know in insurance industries, like for myself, mm-hmm. it's every three years you have to keep everything up and regulated. But with the health insurance industry, it is especially with Medicare and the elderly. Mm. They make you pass so many regulations and tests to just go out and even talk to them. Exactly. The loopholes well, you've well, got to jump through to just go talk to somebody at their home are sometimes astronomical in itself. Uh, yeah, there there are some forms that have to be filled out before, before you can do that. <laughs> before you can even talk to them. You, they, exactly. they, you have to have, that's how the government's involved, got to love this. You have to fill out a form for them to come and talk to you. I have to have, fill out a form. They have to sign it. 
I have to send it to the government, and then I have to keep it for 10 years. <laughs> Mark Barris is over here shaking his head going, this just is. It's just, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it, it's, just, it's just appalling, the, the, the degree of, of regulatory oversight on business. There's my general statement. Mark, I said it. Uh, well, I do kind of understand a little bit when it comes to Medicare because they yeah. want to make sure that there's nothing like elder abuse out there. People are signing people up that they shouldn't be, and I do get it. Um, sometimes I feel it's a little bit of a redundance issue. Mm. And there's fraud, right? Yeah. There's a lot of that. So, so. that's I, I see that as protecting, but I wish that there was a different way that we could do it. Um, so when you're educating people, what are some of the questions that you're asking to help find the products that fit their needs? Um, a lot of it has to do with their personal health. Okay. Uh, uh, if they have any chronic problems and things like that, you know. And if they do have chronic problems, medic they might have other options besides just Medicare. Do you help them with that as well or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And some of it has to do with um, uh, their ability to pay for anything. Uh, you yeah. know, so then, you know, you help them. Uh, I, I've taken people to Social Security before and... Uh, Help them go through that because that's a hassle. What a hassle that is. And, oh, Social Security? Oh, yes. yeah. So yeah. that's signing up for like state aid as well too, yeah. correct? right, right. And then there, there's there's other aid programs that are available and it depends on if they need it or not. And, okay. or, or in fact, if they qualify for it. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. As a business owner, I know how I can, you know, have some stressful and sleepless nights. What made you specifically say, instead of going to work for someone else, I want to work for myself. I have control of my my time. You have control of your time. Yeah, mo mostly. Once in a while, somebody will call and need something, and I'll take care of it. But um, you know, it's it's creating that balance between work and life. Okay. You know, and this allows me to do that completely. So that that's a good that's a good thing that you just mentioned that work and life balance. Sometimes yeah. when you own your own business. There's no life balance. It's all work. <laughs> so what do you do no. to separate yourself and kind of decompress? Oh, yeah, we do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Are you drinking Flying Leaf Wines? <laughs> it definitely helps. <laughs> In fact, we Especially need to talk about cup. that. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the members of the wine club at our, at our rotary. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. We, we, we can remedy this real yeah. quick. Yeah. And we're actually having a function next uh, not this Thursday, but next Thursday. All right. Well, yeah. don't forget, Jamie, that vodka helps too. We make that too. Right? I was going to get you jumped the gun. I didn't get the sample, so, you know, I'm hoping. But no, so what do you do to decompress? What are some of the things that you do to, I guess, oh, well, get yourself um, re-centered? Um, just exercise, walk, exercise? ski, uh, and you like to plan trips. Where where was your last trip? Where did, you went to Africa? Went to Africa, yeah. We went to Dubai first. So talk about expensive wine. Yeah, last time I was in Africa, I was getting shot at. So this is, this is <laughs> I've never been to Africa, so no, we, you, no, we went to Kenya and on, and then on a safari. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Of fun. And I know you, you do enjoy the travel aspect and helping yeah, to do fact, that. Yeah, so. uh, in fact, in about six weeks, we leave for uh, Cairo. Okay. So let's get back to the healthcare industry. I know that in my industry, there are a lot of misconceptions about insurance, what it does, how it helps you. <laughs> what are some misconceptions you find in either Medicare or the healthcare industry or health insurance industries? What uh, are you basically, finding? with the word healthcare. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Please elaborate. Um, there's this misconception that health care is something that you're not responsible for, that someone else is responsible for. And in reality, health care is you. It, you're the one who's responsible for your lifestyle, what you do, what you eat, uh, what kind of exercise you do, if any, uh, you are and responsible for your health. health. You're responsible for your health. Health insurance is there for when you have a, a situation that is beyond your care. So give your us an ability. example. Um, uh, just, just being overweight. Okay. 
uh, you know, when you're 100 or 200 pounds overweight, you know it. Then you got there because you were doing something. It didn't just happen. And there are some cases where, you know, you, you had an accident and something does happen, but your overall health care is something that you should be the one taking care sure. of and taking responsibility for, for right. getting up and trying to do some stuff. Or not, or not going to see a doctor every year and having a physical. And then they miss something and then all of a sudden pop, something pops up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And health insurance is for those um, instances. It's, you're, you're basically transferring risk, just like you are in, in, in any insurance. And you're, and you're paying a premium for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're just turning, tuning in, you're lear- listening to Connecting Tucson with Jamie, where we're focusing on our community and local businesses making some unique connections within our community. As your local insurance professional for professional and commercial lines and small business owner myself, I know how important it is to make new and lasting connections in our community. You never know how a connection will create a spark. I like that, you know, sparky spark. Like my parrot. Yes, like his parrot. (laughs) Or pull you in a direction where you're not even thinking of. So if you're a small business owner or involved in community project and you would like to be featured on the show, please feel free to give me a call here. All of my information is on TucsonBusinessRadioX.com, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, We are broadcasting live from Stuart Title Studios, and we're talking to William or Bill Kuba and uh, Mark Barris for the co-founder of Flying Leap Vineyards. Um, Mark, we were men- you had mentioned in your show uh, just a little bit earlier that your wines had actually won several awards. Weren't you just in a recent, uh, it was 2018, um, Arizona... Yeah, the, the, uh, the yeah the readers and staff yeah, of uh, the Phoenix New Times selected us as the uh, 2018 Winer of the Year, and one of our nice. wines, our 2018 Trio, was the uh, their their uh, pick for Arizona's Best White, and you know that's very subjective awards. Um, I could do a whole show just on the uh, what awards truly mean in the wine business, and. Um, you know, we'll save that for our next podcast. Yeah, that'll be our next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to hear some when, of the, when uh, we can taste test. Yeah, yes, because you, you ought to hear some of the, uh, the crazy. I need to be stuff. an objective person. Having <laughs> what are some of the? All right, now you've piqued my interest. What are some of the crazy stuff? That well, you hear? The, uh, okay, there's uh, and, and you know the, these are opinions and they they vary, but the um, the amount of just nonsensical puffery that goes on with wine awards is truly truly comedy. It's absolutely comedy. There's an Arizona wine maker running around uh, claiming he has the best wine in the United States. It's like the the latest uh, comedy comedy episode uh, that I've seen uh, recently. But you know, it, it, but the, the 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 reality of the, of the matter is is that wine is is a consumable product. It's food, right? It's a mm-hmm. it's a beverage that we all enjoy. And, you know, all wines, everybody has a unique palate. They have different types of flavors that they like and enjoy. And so you take the same wine and you, you pour it to 100 different people, you'll get 100 different responses to it. And so it's very difficult to say, that wine right there, that's a gold medal. And it's funny because if you, d- if you dig into the data, um, you'll find that, you know, that medals are, they're just, they're all, they're, it's almost like throwing darts at a dartboard. And uh, there's been some studies mm. done that have actually proven this, that the awarding of wine medals is basically like throwing darts at a dartboard. It's completely random. And, and um, you know, th- that being said, there, there are some uh, more objective ways to evaluate wines, typically with blind tasting panels. And, uh, you know, people tasting wines blind, uh, giving their impressions and notes, racking and stacking against, uh, you know, similar vintages from similar terroir. From a sim- in, within a similar market, there are places out there that provide that, and those those provide a much more meaningful accounting of you know stratification within the industry, if you will. Well, I just enjoy all of your wines, but I think well, my favorite is well, um, the, your, your new one, the the Graciano. Gras, yeah, and it's almost sold out. It's about gone. It, what? Poof, yeah, yeah. It, that's a fast seller, and. I would we, be stopping by after this podcast hey, to pick up a case of that Jamie, because that's. <laughs> hey, we have been wanting to produce a varietal of Graciano for years, and the last time we did it was with California fruit in 2012 when we were getting our business started. We did make some wine with California fruit, and mm-hmm. uh, 
We produced a varietal of Graciano then with a small amount of Grenache blended in. This time we produced a 100% varietal of it. And it was absolutely wonderful. It was outstanding. Yeah. And I did. I, I had that at the client appreciation event, and my feedback ah, was that was probably— I believe I did too. Yes, you did. <laughs> and that was one of them where it was one of the largest— like the best ones that we had. So when we were giving some wine, yeah, to it tastes good. It's fruity. It's uh, it's big, big alcohol, blackberry flavor. People dig it. Mm. I'm smacking my lips, yep. waiting for my taste <laughs> test. But I, alas, wow. there is no wine here for me to taste. <laughs> um, so obviously, you mentioned earlier, you're not just a winery. You do distilleries. We do. We have a distillery as well. Yeah. So obviously. You're doing so well with the wine. Why do the distillery? That is our number one question we get up at the winery all the time is, why did you build a distillery? And um, there's a very basic answer. The answer is that we grow. Remember I started out our conversation, talked about our agriculture, and we have a a big farming operation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, if you grow wheat, Mark, if you're growing wheat somewhere and you harvest, I don't know, let's say 10,000 bushels of wheat, well, you can sell 2,000 bushels this year, and you can put 8,000 bushels away, and you could sock it away for a couple of years, right, before you sell it on the market. You can wait for prices to go up to wherever you want. Uh, with grapes, you can't do that, okay? And we, when we grow grapes, we can't say, you know what? I think I'll sell uh, Vinify about 20% of this harvest. The other 80% I will store for three years. Can't do it. They spoil too fast. They spoil, like, like within a day. So when the grapes come off the vine, they have to— you have to do something with them right then and there. And the grapes don't care if you're not ready for them. They, they come and they're ready to, <laughs> you know, either go to the birds and the bees, are. right, or, uh, <laughs> or go into, into your fermenters in your wine press. So, the, uh, so because of that, as a, wi- as a farming winery, right, remember, not all wineries are farming wineries. A lot mm-hmm. of there's, there's many different business models at work in our market and elsewhere. Um, but for those... Uh, wineries that actually grow their own grapes, you're you're faced with this conundrum of what do I do with this crop when it comes off the vine? There's three things that you can do with it. When you actually, there's four. You can let it rot, right? You can just let the grapes sit out there and rot. That's a shame. Yeah, uh, that does happen though. Um, not at our vineyards, but it, it does happen uh, some places. But the the first thing that you can do is you can pick the fruit and vinify it. And you can just you just make wine with it, and you 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 chalk your cellar up, and you stockpile inventory, and then you hope and pray that you can sell it down the road. Uh, and remember, wine takes years to make. So, if you have a bumper crop this year, and you vinify the whole crop, and you have all this surplus, that surplus is going to sit and wait uh, for you to do something with it. Right? Risk risky game because wine can spoil, it can it can, uh, it can oxidize, markets can change. Wine is considered a, a luxury item, and you know people's disposable incomes can change, and their preferences can change. Um, so it, it's dangerous to stockpile wine, although it's done. It's not. It's not like it's uncommon, but it, it's from a business perspective, it could be dangerous to do that. The other thing that you can do with the crop is you could sell it to others. You could you could take your grapes. You don't vinify yourself. You could sell it to other wineries. Now, if you're in a in a market where there's a lot of wineries that will compete for your fruit, you can get a pretty good price for your fruit. Here in Arizona, it's it's the opposite. You have a lot of fruit and a, you know, a relatively small amount of wineries. So there's competition amongst growers to sell their fruit to a small number of wineries that have the production capacity and the selling space to vinify and sell the crop. So what that means is that the market's imbalanced, which means there's a – in that balance between grower and winemaker, the, the economic – uh, uh, seesaw is in favor of the winemaker. And so the growers uh, really can't get a very good price for their fruit in Arizona. And and so if you're going to sell your crop off, you're probably going to be selling it at a loss. Mm. And uh, you might get some of your money back out of the crop, but you're probably not going to make a very strong profit on the fruit. So at the current time, selling fruit to other winemakers just isn't a good business decision in our view. The other thing you can do is you you can distill the crop. Right, it's a third option. Um, there's many benefits to distilling the crop. It's very difficult to do it. The, you need a lot of capital to build a distillery. Uh, it's very technical. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. It takes a lot of time and money to put together a distilling operation. So but the we, other Mark was in charge of this. <laughs> yeah, kind of, <laughs> kind of, sort of. And uh, but but once you once you have the distilling capability built, and you've 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 passed all those barriers to entry. Once you have it there, the production cost of alcohol is quite low. 
relative to wine. So it, in fact, it's about one fifth the cost. So per gallon of wine, the cost to make a, a equivalent gallon of liquor is about one fifth. Really? Yeah. So you can make vodka really cheaply. The other the other benefit to it is that when you distill uh, wine, it, it, it reduces the volume considerably. So instead of storing ten thousand gallons, you're only storing a thousand gallons. So you don't need as much space uh, to store it. So you can uh, save on floor space. So I, when I'm down there in May, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to take a tour of the distillery. Oh yeah, you, you prepare to pre- prepare to have your eyes water. It's a uh, it's a it's it, we we have a world class distillery right here in Arizona and. You know, it's it's we have a lot of customers come through there. We have about twenty thousand a year through our door, and uh, at this point, but the distillery is a show place. It's a beautiful facility. It's well designed. It's well put together. It's thoughtfully put together, and it's extraordinarily capable. Right? This isn't something that's in your garage, some little uh, sort of small time operation. Right? This is a this is a professional world class distillery. Well, I am certainly excited to to see that and I would tell anybody that's out there please go onto the links check it out get down there check out the distillery check out the wineries because mm-hmm. you're not just located in Elgin where, where well that you're talking about a retail operation yeah. that's we have eight tasting rooms eight around tasting the state rooms, correct and uh, you know we have two at the winery state we have our wine tasting room there and then we have our distillery tasting room mm-hmm. and then we have six tasting rooms around Arizona in Wilcox, Bisbee, Tubac, here in Tucson, like you mentioned earlier. My Up fave. north, we have tasting rooms in Prescott and Sedona. Nice. But you asked about why the distillery, and the punchline to that was that the, dis- the, dis- the distillery gives us the ability to fully process our entire harvest without having to sell fruit to other wineries, which is a money-losing operation, or vinifying the whole crop and stockpiling wine that we can't sell. So you're making, it's almost like a win, 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 win. It's a win, win. It's a 360 degree win. That's exactly correct. And we have a, you know, we're one of the, you talk at the beginning of our discussion, you asked about what makes us unique. And one of the most unique things about Flying Leap within our market in and amongst our own competitors is that Flying Leap has a lever. You know, we can, we can vinify or we can distill, we can choose. So because our winery and our distillery share our harvest and depending on market conditions, customer behavior, um, preferences, things like that, we can we can move that leather lev, lever to wine or to uh, or to spirit. Well, that is super interesting, mm-hmm. and I cannot wait. I'm sorry. Ah. I go down there on May 11th. Just right. thought I'd let you know. Set your calendar so you can meet me down there. All right. We'll get some <laughs> vodka shots. You should come. Oh, Bill, did you have a question? Oh no! Yeah, uh, yeah. I was thinking uh, in, in terms of of the uh, distillery mm-hmm. when you're saying that uh, it reduces almost ten, uh, almost uh, the volume, the volume. Mm-hmm. And so, what's the shelf life? Ah, uh, thousands <laughs> of years. Yeah. I mean, the uh, yeah. you know the, versus the wine. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, yeah. 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 When you, well, the the higher the alcohol, the longer the shelf that's life. Right. Yeah. That's just kind of. No, I just you didn't mention that, and I thought you yeah. want to get that. Well, and I, I didn't. And so one of the other benefits, really, is when you distill the crop, <laughs> you 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 could store it forever. I mean, it, yeah. it it it'll eventually evaporate out of the barrel after a couple hundred centuries or whatever. But <laughs> but uh, in in the short term, that being within ten years, it'll be it should be your losses will be fairly minimal, mm-hmm. and and there's very little that you have to do to store it other than put it in a barrel and leave it alone. Uh, the temperatures can swing up and down. The humidity can swing up and down. Um, and all of that is only going to make the product better. Better. My mouth is watering. Yeah. You all can't see this online. Where, on the other hand, if those things happen to the, your wine in yeah, barrels, you have some trouble. Yes, wine is a whole different story. Wine, yeah. you have to keep the temperature on wine in a very narrow band. Otherwise, you, it can turn. That's right. You have to keep the humidity around the barrels fairly high because you'll get too many losses. I've had uh, some bad wines turn. Yeah. I've had some good wines turn bad because I was not able to keep them at the correct temperature. That's right. So. Yeah, you have to take care of wine. And when you're making commer- a commercial pro- production of wine, you really have to guard them. Then you have to watch the chemistry. You have to make sure there's enough free sulfur in the wine to prevent it from oxidizing, for example. Um, you have to keep the barrels topped off to prevent you know oxygen from impacting on the top of the uh, the wine in the barrel. And then you have to... There's just a number of things you have to do. You have to watch your acidity in the wine. You have to keep a check on that. You have to. I thought you were about to say watch your ass. No, not ass. <laughs> acidity. 
acidity. Well, you can tell you where her mind is. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, you know, and then and then wine has to be kept cool, relatively cool, and out of sunlight, for example. And exactly, wine, wine's very finicky as a product, and uh, booze is not. No, well, that's true. Booze can pretty much last forever. Yeah. So, Bill, I'm actually we've been talking about benefits of all of those with the winery. What is we're going to go to benefits to having you as an insurance agent um, or an advisor. I know a lot of people try to go online and do it themselves. Why should they not do that and go to somebody that like yourself? Because they have no idea what the benefits are. What are some of the benefits? Well, I mean, it depends. Well, it like, depends. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, uh, you, you can get a summary of the benefits, but it doesn't really tell you what they are, how to, how to access them, and if they're the ones you need. And on some of those sites, they try to get you to talk to somebody live anyways. Um, so isn't it, is it in their best interest to talk to somebody live? Is that person on the other end of the 800 number is knowledgeable or know all of the products that are out could, there? Could be or could not be. Just depends on the company? It depends on the company. It depends on the person. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, you can try to teach people the way it should be done, uh, but you can't watch them all the time, and you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know what they're going through, and especially if they're, they're, they have no responsibility whatsoever, whatsoever after the person enrolls. So that's the other key that I wanted to to bring out. You know, if you're enrolling online, if they have an issue or a question, it's they'd have to call an eight hundred number. But if they had an issue or a question and you help them enroll, can they can they call you and? Oh, I encourage everybody to call me. Okay, so yeah. how how would you walk them through a process if they had a question? I mean, is that something that you can help them with as an agent, or do you have to? Well, it depends. It depends if I can do it directly, I'll do it. If I can't, um, um, I know who can. You can get them in touch with the right person. Right person, yeah. And a lot of times, to me, in my mind, that's that's good. That's gold. I don't want to have to call five or seven different 800 numbers to try to reach a department that I should have reached with one phone call. Right. And, and again, it depends on what, what carrier you're dealing with. And having been in the business a little while, um, just a little, uh, <laughs> well, you, uh, you know, what carriers to represent because you don't want your, your client calling that 800 number and being put on hold and transferred around to 15 people and never getting the answer. Because that would frustrate them as well. Yeah, because they don't they don't blame the company. They blame you. Because you sold them the policy. Because you sold them the policy, <laughs> right. Um, so, well, that that's a great point, too. So mm. you've obviously been doing this for several years now. Why do you think you're so successful? Why do you think people are? Because you said you don't really do a lot of marketing. You just have your clients. Are they referring you? How How are you getting? Well, I, I do. I do a kiosk. Okay. Um, where can they find you at your kiosk? Um, it depends on where. Right now, I'm just finishing up one at the Fries at Rita Ranch. Okay. Uh, I'm there one day a week for four hours, and uh, then during a annual enrollment period there, I'm, I'm there longer than that. <laughs> so you're mainly, um, you mainly focus on annual enrollments down on the Southern side of Tucson, correct? No, or You no, go everywhere? I'm all, all over. Yeah. So do you go all over the state of Arizona or do you I, just... I can, yes. Okay. So... And, and not just Arizona. I do Texas, Oklahoma, California, and Illinois now. So you're racking up the states, and do you have to do testing in every single one of those states on top of every single carrier? Yeah. Did you just really like school as a kid? <laughs> I'm just asking. <laughs> no, no. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there going like, uh, you, you have how many states now? Seven? No, just five. Just five. <laughs> five states, and I know you have multiple carriers, and in each of those states, you still have to test for each of those carriers. Oh, for the carriers, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah. but not for, the, not for the government, but you still have to test. test. Yeah, because every state, hell, every county has a different program. <laughs> oh. 
I, I think we just need to have our own podcast to talk about oh, the boy. Medicare thing that's going on. But I'm, I'm telling you, it's just I'm sure you've gone through some of your share of learning experiences as you've been there. As somebody who's been in the business and had some learning experiences, what are some of the learning experiences that you wish somebody would have told you when you started this? What are some things that you wish somebody would have told you about running your own business? Oh, running my own business. And starting this, Anybody, yes. I mean, I've run businesses all my life, so... Um, uh, gosh, I mean, I pretty much knew what I was doing when I got involved with this. Uh, you know, but the the thing is the personal attention that you pay to your clients. Making it a personable touch. Oh, yeah. You can't be successful in this line of business without making it personal. Uh, well, and I'm, I'm starting to believe that... Well, because you need you need to have a certain relationship, a certain trust with people. If people don't trust you, uh, which there's a lot of that going on right now, mm-hmm. uh, and and it frustrates you, and and you don't have repeat business, you don't have you don't have uh, referrals. You, uh, you know, it's. Uh, I suppose the the only thing in this particular business that I would uh, I might have. Had some problem with was just the government stuff. <laughs> to re- I'm laughing only. I should if you laugh because I have the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, every yeah. every year you have the, that one that uh, 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 fraud thing that you have to take. It's the same information every year, but it costs you 175 dollars to take the test. And you have to take it every year. I have to take it every year. <laughs> <laughs> At least you don't have to take it every year in every single state. It's just no, the no, one. Just that's, that's, good. that's good. That's the one test for all the states. That's good. So we are nearing the end of our show, sadly, and I really wish we had more time to talk to both of you. But I always end my show with one specific question, and I'm going to ask it. You guys can do like rock, paper, scissors to see who would like to go first or not. <laughs> okay, there we go. Ready? Here we go. So basically, um, what do you consider to be your biggest regret, either in business or in life? Um and what would you have done to change it? My biggest, my my biggest regret, with with re- respect business, to our wine business, business life, anything. What it, um, you wish you would have taken a different path to get you somewhere sooner. Well, I wish you it wish could you have been. You wish you wouldn't have eaten that gas station sushi that yeah, one time. I, I wish it could have been a BMW salesman. That was like <laughs> you know the one thing I w- I really wish I could do if I could go back, or a road grader driver, which I you know a what driver? Uh, a tractor driver, like a oh. ro- you know I like road graders, and so I was like. You know, that would have been a lot of fun. I wish it could have started sooner. Um, no, uh, in, in terms of... Uh, no, in, I thought he was serious. <laughs> no. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, no. It re- regrets? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really think about regrets. Uh, I, I'm very forward-thinking, and I've, you know, there's... I mean, I've got... I, if I could just sat here and had myself an adult beverage or three, I could sit here and lament things I've done wrong and mistakes I've made in the past opportunities I've missed. But, you know, I, I just, I just don't think like that. I mean, I, um, you don't dwell on the past. I really don't Every No, If I did, I'd go, I, I'd literally be depressed 24 hours a day. If I did that, the, uh, no, I just, I just keep, I just keep one foot I keep trudging forward. And, you know, every morning without exception, I wake up and all I think about is success. How, you know, that, that's all that's I think. That's a great philosophy That's to literally, have. that's all I think about. It's what am I going to do today to be successful? And, you know, I, I, one of the things that I would, that I, that I would offer as advice to others is that some, years ago, a, a gentleman I knew taught me this and it was, it stuck with me. And it, it was that you define success. I mean, you do. So other people don't define what success is for you. You define it. And if you set achievable goals for yourself and define your own parameters for what is and isn't success, then you're successful. And as long as you can be satisfied with that, you're always going to be happy, right? And um, I like that. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, there. Regret. So it's hard for me because I just don't. I just don't think that much about things that I regret. You know, I regret that I fell off a ladder last weekend. I really regret that I didn't have somebody hold the ladder. I was a candidate for a Darwin Award, uh, Bill, and <laughs> I regret that because I'm limping around like a gimp, right? Uh-huh. So I regret that I was foolish and didn't follow standard safety precautions with a ladder. 
That is a good regret to have because, yeah. you know, but did you learn your lesson? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, how about you? Do you have any regrets or maybe some final thoughts? Um, no regrets. No, I, I, I think along the same lines, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things. For instance, um, you know, we lost a lot of money on the, on the, uh, um, Flero franchise, uh, but I just look at it, it's only money. I didn't lose anything else. That's true. You know, and it's not a regret. You know, I would not, I would not, I would not uh, uh, have done that because if, you, if you're going to try something and you say, oh, no, I'm worried I'm, it's not going to be successful, you're never going to do anything, you know. You that just, fear sometimes stops you from... I, I might regret that. So you don't want that fear to yeah, stop Yeah, that's you. stupid. <laughs> I mean, it is. You know, Bill if you want to like do... Bill tells it like it is. Bill tells it just like it is. That's why I like it. <laughs> well, no, I mean... It's, you know, it's, 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 it's entrepreneurship. Exactly. And entrepreneurs, Jamie, have a wiring in their head. And, you know, they're, they're risk takers by nature. And I would argue to anybody that to be a good entrepreneur, you just simply have got to have a high tolerance for risk because it's part of the... It's part of the business, and it's in the DNA of entrepreneurs. And a high tolerance for people telling you no. <laughs> yeah, they well, do. rejection. Yeah, rejection. you, you yeah. have to be able to handle rejection. You know, it was right. like, um, and I don't know if we talked about that before. Uh, when I had that situation where I could go run a company in Australia, I mean, at the time, that was like the dark side of the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I have this. She said, what? You're going to move to Australia? What? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we made we made a deal that she could come back if she, you know, if she really hated it there, but uh, uh, she loved the place. You can learn to eat kangaroo. <laughs> you know, I, I really tell you. really sad for a second. I tell, All you, right. I tell you what, Jamie, and, you know, we, we just got rid of a tremendous amount of negative energy at our company, and I won't go into it, but it's, you know, it, it's... Weight lifted off your shoulder. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's like 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 a like a like a millstone taken off around our neck. And you know, when when you're around that, it's just like these kinds of people. They're just like kryptonite, you know. And mm. these energy vampires. And the sooner you can get them out, the better and more successful you'll be. Energy vampires. And we're gonna end on that <laughs> note. When that visual for fangs all fangs out. Fangs out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have for connecting with Tucson today here at Stuart Title Studios. If you liked the show, please let us know. You can let uh, get to know a little bit more about Mark or Bill at go to TucsonBusinessRadioX.com and click on Connecting Tucson with Jamie. As always, do not be afraid to step out of your comfort zone, fangs out, of course, and make a new connection. You never know where it might lead. Until next time. Might lead to a pumpkin pie. Oh, pumpkin pies. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. Sure.